Good afternoon, Year 8s. Nice to see you again. Uh, this is Mr. Davis speaking. Um, so today's lesson is another lesson on the sonnet form, another lesson on poetry through time, the module that we're looking at this term. So, so far you've looked at sonnets 130 and sonnets 116 by William Shakespeare. This is our third Shakespearean sonnet and final Shakespearean sonnet of the, of the video unit before we move on to a different poet, uh, but a similar form. We're going to look at another sonnet after this. So the sonnet we're looking at today is Sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare. It is arguably his most famous sonnet of all. And I'm sure most of us, uh, even if we don't know it, are aware of the opening line, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Uh, for those of you who, are, who have uh, last lesson fresh in your minds, you'll remember that last sonnet, Shakespeare often compares his lover to various objects. And this poem is actually... Uh, almost an extended metaphor, so he's comparing his lover to um, a summer's day, and we'll look at the subtleties of that poem in today's lesson. So, just to re-establish a couple of rules, um, just make sure when I say pause the video, please do pause the video. Um, it, it gives you a good chance to check your understanding. You can also play back elements of the video that you missed the first time round. Uh, I appreciate that it's hard uh, it's hard work having to follow my instructions and also take notes and also read the poem at the same time. So please do pause the video, rewind, go back, uh, listen again. Okay, so like I said, today's sonnet is Sonnet 18, finishing on a high, arguably the most famous sonnet of all time. I hope you enjoy it. Um, please do make sure you read the instructions and show my homework very carefully about what your uh, independent task will be afterwards. See you soon. Uh, let's have a look at the poem. Okay, in a similar vein to last lesson, I'm going to start by reading the poem a couple of times, and then I'm going to ask you to pause the video and just read it independently and take your own notes and, and come up with your own ideas and your own interpretations about the meaning of the poem. Um, what I'll do is I'll read it through once and just get a feel of the poem, and then the second time I'll go through and just define some of the vocabulary that we might not understand. Um, so I, 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 I'm, first you'll notice that my copy actually doesn't look like a sonnet, it's because I'm reading from an anthology, so actually half of it is on this page, the other half is on a different page. Okay, so Sonnet 18 by William Shakespeare. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease leaf hath all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wondrous in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Okay, so you'll notice I found my other copy, of course, an English teacher must have more than one copy of Sonnet 18. So I'll read that through again, and then I'm going to set you some independent tasks to be doing, uh, just to check for your understanding so far. So, reading number two. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease has all too short a date. Sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often it is gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wondrous in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Okay, now I'd like you to pause the video. And what I'd like to do, which we didn't do last lesson, is I'd actually like you to take the time to annotate your copy, if it's, it's either digital or printed out in front of you. And can you make sure that you go through the rhyme scheme, you annotate uh, the lines, you count the metre, you tell me how many quatrains, how many syllables on each line. You, you annotate uh, the features and the conventions of a Shakespearean sonnet. So, so by the time 
you come back, I'll show you what mine looks like and hopefully yours looks exactly the same as mine. I'd be very interested to know where you think, I know we've not really read the poem in much detail yet, but where you think that Volta is. That would be quite an interesting uh, comparison. Maybe you and I have the same, uh, maybe we notice the same shift or maybe we don't. So you're going to firstly go away and you're going to pause the video and you're going to annotate the features or the conventions of a Shakespearean sonnet. What I'd also like you to do is consider the following questions. So far, what do you think this poem is about? What are, the, what are the broader themes of this poem? Remember, each sonnet is almost like an argument compressed into only 14 lines. So what is the poet, uh, what, what are his themes? What's the subtext of the poem? Second question is, what are your impressions of the poem so far? And the third question is, what is interesting to you about the poem so far? So those are your three questions I'd like you to consider alongside the task of independent annotation. So when I, come, when I ask you to come back, yours should look the same as mine. So please pause the video and I'll see you in about five minutes. Goodbye. Okay, welcome back. I wonder if your poem is annotated and looks the same as mine. And I wonder if you, if you made the same decision, if you, if you notice that the Volta is the word but on line nine. Uh, make sure you've got the ambic pentameter, you've got the rhyme scheme of A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. You've got the annotation of Shakespearean couplets, which is why it's called a Shakespearean sonnet in the first place. We've got the quatrain, the lines of four, we've got the octave, lines of eight. Um, and we've got this idea of the poem being structured in ten syllables of line, iambic pentameter. Okay, brilliant. What we'll now look at is we'll look at the meaning of this poem we'll try, and we'll read it through and we'll start to annotate and I'll try and, uh, I'll try and explain some of the words that might be slightly difficult okay, as we go through. So, so far we might have a vague idea um, of the poem's meaning but hopefully by the end of this lesson you'll have a much clearer idea which will help you in your independent tasks. So this poem, very similar to the other poems in a sense in that it opens with a kind of declaration from the poets and we have this the voice of the poet Perhaps, or if he's or or a persona, we don't. We, it's, it's hard. To, again, we don't. We don't know for sure whether this is Shakespeare's own voice he's writing in, or, or or the voice of a persona. We do know that the earlier poems were addressed to a young man, as opposed to a dark lady, who is the subject of the latter poems. That I think the poems um, from about about sonnet one hundred twenty-seven onwards. So there's a dark lady for the later poems, and a young man for the earlier poems. So there is perhaps a homoerotic element to this, or perhaps he's writing. Uh, to a patron. Remember, Shakespeare was largely sponsored by wealthy lords, including the, I think the Lord of, uh, of Southampton was one of his earlier sponsors. So that's how he make his living. So maybe this is a way of um, thanking uh, his patron or, or kind of sending his gratitude to his patron. But I, I would read it for the, initially, especially as a, as, a, as a kind of conventional love sonnet in a sense. Um, and we'll look about, about why uh, as we go through. So the poem opens with this declaration, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And it's kind of similar to the opening line of Sonnet 130, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun, except this time he is making a comparison between the object of his love, his love, his love interest, and the summer's day. So we've got this direct use of comparison, we've got this use of a simile, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Shall I compare thee to something that you're not, but to something that's clearly uh, beautiful. So we have this imagery um, of the summer's day. Uh, obviously, a summer's day associated with beauty, with warmth, with light, um, lots of positive connotations. Uh, so he's comparing his lover to a summer's day, but Shakespeare's a very clever poet, obviously, and I'm sure there is more meaning to this comparison than meets the eye. Initially, though, we might think a summer's day has the, have, have those connotations uh, of perhaps uh, warmth, liberty. Um, beauty. Okay, so he's he's made this comp comparison, and like I said, a, a poet is you a, a sonnet. So not a poet. A, a sonnet is usually what we would call a compressed argument. So throughout the so in only fourteen lines, Shakespeare is making a condensed argument, an argument that he's having to compress and squeeze into just these fourteen lines, and the subject matter of the sonnet is introduced straight away, immediately. Shall I compare these, compare these to Summer's Day? And as readers, we can kind of almost have an anticipation of what the rest of the sonnet will be about. It will be about the comparison between the lover, uh, sorry, the lover and, and the Summer's Day and, and why they are perhaps similar or dissimilar, as we'll go on to read. Shakespeare's next line, line two, thou art more lovely and more temperate. Okay. 
So we've got the comparative adjective. Comparative adjective uh, repeated twice. We've got more lovely and more temperate. So actually, unlike Sonnet 130, where he says, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. In this poem, he actually, uh, it's almost the opposite. He's saying, he's saying that the beauty of his lover exceeds that of a summer's day. It's actually more beautiful, more radiant than a summer's day. So his lover in this sense, he is, we talked about last lesson how he, he seems to be mocking these cliched um, metaphors that lovers speak in when they're courting or when they're wooing. And in this case, I think Shakespeare is himself using a cliche um, and trying to idealise his love interest. He's saying that she is, she or he is lovelier and more temperate. Temperate is an odd choice of word. Temperate just means kind of mild. Um, so it's an, so he's saying that essentially his lover is as beautiful as a summer's day, but without the maybe the um, downsides of a summer's day, which is the excessive heat. So the lover is milder, more gentle, more approachable, more lovely, more radiant. So uh, again, I'm going to write the word idealizing here, or ide I because I think this is what he's doing. He's he's turning his lover into, uh, he's kind of putting her on a metaphorical pedestal and almost. Um, in his comparison, it's it's certainly not mimesis, which is what we talked about last lesson. He's certainly not describing as he actually is. He's, I would say, uh, hyperbolizing, which means he is, I'll, I'll write a few, hyperbolizing. It means he's exaggerating to a certain extent. But he's exaggerating in order to flatter her, I, I, we can assume. So, so far we've got, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Uh, and we've got that lovely and unforgettable uh, opening rhetorical question. Um, he doesn't, it's self-evident that he's not expecting a response. He's actually going to, he's asked himself the question in, in almost a philosophical way. And now he's going to answer that question that he, he himself posed. Line three, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May and summer's leaths has all too short a date. So we've got clearly so far in this poem, a lot of pathetic fallacy, a lot of references to the weather, to the seasons. And you may have noticed, some of you, uh, that he's not, in line three, he's not talking about summer. He's talking about the season of spring. Um, spring usually has connotations of rebirth, regeneration, uh, new life, resurrection. Okay. So he's saying, you know, you're more lovely and more temperate than spring. And summer is what I think he's saying, given the, the use of the colon at the end of line two. Uh, because in spring, you still have rough winds that are shaking the darling buds. So spring is beautiful, but because of the weather in spring, which I'm sure we can all uh, at this moment uh, appreciate, because of the weather being uh, less mild, more uh, volatile, spring is not as beautiful as lover either. But you've got this quite beautiful image of the darling buds, uh, which are the the buds of the flowers, the buds of the plants that, are, that have yet to bloom. So I, again, you, please do make your own interpretations, but I think he's saying so far that in, his lover is more beautiful in summer uh, and more mild, and he, she's more, he or she is more beautiful in spring uh, because of spring having a tendency to uh, be a season of kind of volatile climates and volatile weather. Okay, so now he's gonna come back on line four to his subject matter, and his subject matter was summer's lease. Okay, and remember, he's the, the opening line is "Shall I compare thee to a summer's day?" So he's going back over the similarities and dissimilarities, or the differences between the seasons of summer and the lover, and he he kind of ponders about this. He says, "Summer's lease hath all too short a date," and what I think he's going on to, and it's actually a, I I would argue a slight shift in the subject matter is he's now talking about the defects or the faults of summer. Summer is not perfect. Summer is not um, ideal, even though it's beautiful. Whereas, I would argue, whereas his lover perhaps is perfect and is ideal. Okay. And here, here he starts to list the faults that summer has. Okay. Summer's lease hath all too short a date. A lease is a contract, okay? You take out a lease on a house if you're renting a house. So it's a contract you have, okay? So the contract that Summer has, and so Summer is clearly here personified, okay? Summer's lease hath all too short a date. Um, 
he's saying summer's contract is not short it's not long it's not long lasting it's, it's quite short and i think the, the metaphor of this line for me has many interpretate possible interpretations but the obvious one would be that he he's declaring summer may be beautiful it may be the, the most beautiful of the seasons however it doesn't last for long enough and so therefore um it has its faults and i think if we go back to the summer's day and the beauty of the lover uh, I think he might be indicating that the, the beauty of the lover will last for a long time, whereas the, su the season of summer will not last for a long time. OK, so it has too short a date, meaning it will not last as long as, as other seasons, perhaps. Brilliant. We have come to the end. I know it's quite uh, quite a lot of information. We've come to the end of the first um, quatrain. So what I would like you to do now is pause the video, please, and just write a brief summary uh, showing me your understanding of the poem so far and just kind of get a chance to clear your heads and read it yourself. I would suggest reading over the poem again before you answer any questions and before you put pen to paper. So just summarise your understanding of the poem so far, crystallise your own thinking and you should come back to watching the video in about five minutes time and I'll see you then. Okay, welcome back. I hope that was useful. I hope that helped, I hope that helped you to crystallise your own thinking and take time to consider the poem on your own. Remember, I'm, when I read your work on this, I really want to hear your own opinions and your own interpretations, not just um, a regurgitated version of my um, reading of the poem. And remember that I will miss out, or, or you know, I, I, I'm sure I'll make errors. I'm sure I will um, overlook things that you may notice yourself. Okay, so we're on line five. We've just had that description of summer's lease having a too short a date, and I think the, sh the poet is lamenting the fact that summer uh, does not last for long enough, that it's got a fleeting and transient season, uh, as compared to maybe how winter often feels, when winter feels almost everlasting, doesn't it? Especially this last winter. Okay, so the next line, and he's still comparing the two. You can tell by the use of punctuation, the use of the colons, that he's it's an extended argument he's making here. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. Okay, well that seems almost straightforward, which is surprising for Shakespeare. We've got the metaphor and the personification, I suppose. Uh, the eye of heaven, metaphorically, uh, is the sun. Sometimes the the sun's light shines and it's too hot. So again, what he's doing is he's, he's finding faults, isn't he? He's finding defects in summer. He's, he's making a list of reasons that summer is not as perfect as it might seem, whereas his lover is so sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines uh, and often is his gold complexion dimmed um his gold complexion again is, a, is an example of personification and the gold complexion presumably is a metaphor for the sunlight and you some and often his sunlight is dimmed often the light is dimmed it's often um overcast it's, it's all the, all the, all blocks so i guess the dimmed ref refers to the creation of shadows or to the blocking out of the sunlight. Um, and he's talking again about how summer is not as ideal or as perfect as he thought or as people think. Um, there is a touch of religious ideas, but I'm not sure I would go too deep into them or too far with the interpretations that link to religious ideas here. I think the eye of heaven is simply a poetic way of describing the sun. I think the gold complexion of the sun is often blocked by objects, uh, which is, is my would be my interpretation, but please do make your own interpretations. Okay, the next line is probably the, well, the next two lines up until the end of this quatrain are probably the two lines that students find most tricky because of the use of archaic language. And archaic means kind of old or antiquated language, language that we, we don't really tend to use today. So, Two examples of that, we've got the word fair, which, uh, you know, has lots of different meanings in modern English. But in this sense, fair is is used as an adjective to describe someone's appearance. If you're fair, you are beautiful. Um, and the second word you might struggle with is untrimmed. And that means unchanging. OK, if you're if you're going to if you're if you're if you're, if you're we'll, we'll look at that line in context. But untrimmed just means unchanging or not changing direction. Um, good okay so sometimes too hot the eye of heaven shines and oft is his gold complexion dimmed 
and every fair from fair sometimes declines. Okay, and we've got this lovely, I think it's a lovely kind of echo of the previous lines. We've got that word declines, that verb, okay? And I think Shakespeare is making the link between the decline of the sun, and that kind of makes sense now with the word dimmed. The sun it descends, doesn't it? So the light will dim. And this time we've got the use of the word decline. Again, it has, it has associations of sunsets and, and of the sun declining at the end of the day. So, again, we've got this, it, lo lots, lots and lots and lots of light imagery so far. Anyway, that, that line. And every fair from fair sometime decline. Uh, and we know that fair means beauty. So logically, this sentence or this line, sorry, really means that every person's beauty sometimes declines. Okay, so now he's talking about, I think he's changed subjects a little bit. He was talking about the, the season of summer initially. And now I think he's talking about the beauty of the lover or the beauty of, uh, of, human, be of human beauty. Okay, every fair, from, every fair from fair sometimes declines. So every beauty uh, sometimes declines. So um, I think he's now, I don't know if you remember the first poem, um, about how love, true love, lasts till the end of time. Um, I think this is a, a kind of a recurring theme in Shakespearean sonnets, which is mortality. The idea that uh, our lifespans are brief, that everyone faces the prospects of death, and therefore beauty, in terms of human beauty, physical beauty, uh, is not everlasting. It will decline, just like the sun that is declining, in the, in, in the kind of the double meaning of that word decline there. And line eight, the final line of this quatrain, and the final line of the octave, which is the line of eight, we talked about before, it's a term from, we recognise that from our music lessons, but an octave is just an octave, octave, octave just comes from the word eight. Uh, this, the final line of the octave is continuing this description of the beauty, the beauty fading um, and declining. And he says, beauty sometimes declines by chance. So, you know, sometimes people lose their looks by chance, by maybe by accident, for example, um, you know, kind of, some might sound facetious, but uh, uh, someone might suffer an injury or, or a facial wound or whatever. So by chance, they might, lose, their beauty might evaporate or might, you know, they might not be as beautiful they used to be. Or nature's changing course untrimmed. Okay. Interestingly, he uses a metaphor here. And still, there's lots of personification. We've got nature personified. We've got summer personified so far. But we've got this metaphor which explains to us what will happen, to, what, what Shakespeare argues about physical beauty and what happens to people who are beautiful or, or handsome. Um, they may lose their beauty by chance or by nature's changing course untrimmed, which means uh, here, here I think he's using language that is nautical. Um, nautical means in relation to sailing again. Um, so it, it means in relation to uh, navigation. So, Shakespeare here is arguing that nature's course, which let's say nature is, the sh is, is kind of metaphorically a ship here, uh, nature's changing course untrimmed, the fact that nature's course, the course of their life will uh, result in their beauty fading through natural causes. So because of this passage of time, I think is what his reference, his metaphor kind of signifies, because time is going on its it meanders on its way, but it's not really ever going to change, is it? It's, it's, it's always going to be un unchanging in a sense because time is linear, it goes in one direction. Because time, like a ship, is travelling, but in this sense, with a de with a destination that will not be changed, that lover might lose their their beauty. So it's about how, again, to put it, that was a very waffly way of explaining the fact that he's arguing that through natural aging and through the aging process, uh, beauty disappears, okay? So going back to that first line, he says, shall I compare these to a summer's day? And now he's making, I think the argument is that just like a summer's day, uh, the lover is maybe beautiful, but that, that beauty will not last forever. That would be my way of explaining that shift in that, in that, last, quart, uh, that last quatrain. Okay, so we come, we come to the end of the octave, we come to the end of the quatra, second quatrain. Again, can I get you to have a read over the whole thing from shall I up until untrimmed, but then just from lines five to eight, 
if you could just summarize your understanding of that quatrain in your own words. Feel free to pick out individual words or quotations to help you explain uh, your understanding and make sure you please pause the video now and I would give yourself at least five minutes uh, longer if you need. Make sure you read through annotations again and I'll see you in five minutes. Please pause the video. Hello again and welcome back. I hope that helps again to kind of consolidate your understanding of the poem so far. Let's proceed. We are on line nine and we're going to go from line nine to twelve. Um, so line nine, you can see my notes here, I've written the word volta, just to remind you what that means. In poetry it means a shift or the kind of turning point of the poem. Essentially it's the moment where the poet uh, takes their previous argument and kind of flips it on its head uh, and completely transforms the poem in a sense. And the argument that Shakespeare has been making so far, just to remind ourselves, is uh, the comparison of, of his lover or his love interest to a summer's day and the fact that summer is too short, that its light is, not, is sometimes too hot, that sometimes it gets blocked out. Uh, he's argued that beauty declines uh, either by chance or by the ageing process. Okay, and I think he's talking about general beauty rather than just the lover, uh, the lover's beauty. Because that but is a huge... Volta, isn't it? But, and I think all, almost all of us would have identified that Volta from the beginning of the lesson. But, thy eternal summer shall not fade. Okay. Uh, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. Okay. This is lovely. It's a beautiful. It's a beautiful imagery. Again, we've got the, the again the use of the pathetic fallacy, the use of light imagery, and metaphor all kind of combined in one here. Your eternal summer shall not fade. So unlike the summer at the beginning of line one, the lover's eternal summer, which is obviously a metaphor uh, for their beauty, I assume one can assume, and their everlasting. The use of eternal is quite an important adjective here. Their everlasting beauty will not fade and maybe at this point it, it might be worth saying that is Shakespeare like in po poem in sonnet 130 is Shakespeare perhaps toying with the reader as well here uh, maybe maybe he's talking about his love for the lover rather than the lover's beauty but let's that's just a speculation but your eternal summer shall not fade nor lose possession of that fair that thou, thou owest okay and I'm just going to highlight the wordplay here because we talked about the fact that fair means beautiful but obviously in the context of this line fair could also be interpreted as being a charge if you're if you're if you're charged if you if you pay a fair you pay a charge right um so it's, there's two meanings that the fair the fair that you've been given by god or the fair that you've been charged um in terms of monetary charging so your eternal summer will never disappear, and you will not lose possession of that fair. So again, um, he, the nor is used as a, as a kind of example of repetition uh, to consolidate his point, which is that the lover's beauty will not disappear, will not fade, is not transient, unlike the summer. So you will not lose possession of your beauty, you will, uh, nor will death brag that you wander in shade. And this is a beautiful metaphor, isn't it? And again, we've got this example of the personification of death. Uh, you could read that in multiple different ways. You could read it. I know, I know, I know the, the likes of Hassan will read this as, as being uh, an allusion to classical mythology, perhaps. And, and um, maybe it is. And please feel free, if you want to talk about that in your interpretations, then feel free to do so. So death has been personified. Usually you get a capital D. In my version, you don't have a capital D, but in most poems I've seen of this before, it is capitalised as capital D. So death will not brag that you wander in a shade. So essentially, metaphorically, he's saying that death will not be able to brag that it has possession of you. Okay, death won't be able to brag that you are in, that he is um, that you are in his possession, which is interesting because that's actually the opposite of. Uh, that's the opposite of what he argued in the previous poem, in, in a sense, because in the last poem he praises his lover uh, for not being a goddess. And in this poem, he seems to suggest that his lover here is immortal. Um, so he's saying that God, 
uh, and perhaps it is that Greek god of death, Thanosos. God will not brag, uh, sorry, the god of death will not brag that you are wonder in his shade because he'll never have possession of you. So it's again, going back to the earlier point about how um, he starts musing about um, mortality. He's now talking about immortality and su suggesting that his lover can never be, um, can never die. And that seems, it seems like an example of hyperbole, of exaggeration. But we've talked about how this Volta, but there, it changes the meaning of the poem. And when he says, you know, my lover will never die, he will never wander in death's shade. Um, and notice how the shade and immortality and death is, is, is an example of darkness. And there isn't much darkness in this poem, there's so much light and not much darkness. But darkness and death are, are, are combined. So the lover will not be able to be, uh, to, to be taken away by death, which is interesting. And we have to ask the question, surely that can't be so, because all of us are mortal beings and all of us will eventually wander in death's shade. So how is Shakespeare going to get out of this um, inconsistency or this, this, this problem that he's kind of found himself in? And it, it, the line 12 explains it. When in eternal lines to time thou growest. Okay, and we've got this, again, it's almost like the light and dark imagery is, is used and in multiple different ways and with multiple different meanings. At this point, it's almost as if he's talking about photosynthesis and he's talking about the idea that plants use light to, to generate glucose and to, 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 to build energy levels, etc., etc. I'm not going to go into a biology lesson, but the point is that light is used to make energy by plants and that's how they grow. Um, so he's saying that you're not going to wander in the shade. I mean, and, and, and remember, plants in most plants w need sunlight to grow, so they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to grow in the in, in the shade. Hence, why Mr. Davis's garden is usually a barren wasteland because there isn't enough, enough sun where I live. So death will not be able to claim you in his shade, uh, but you're going to grow like a plant in eternal lines, uh, metaphorically again. And earlier. The metaphor was the eternal summer, and that was the beauty of the of the lover. And now we're saying he's going to grow in eternal lines. And the eternal lines. This is an example of kind of um, it's quite clever, quite a clever philosophical argument. The eternal line, lines, I would argue, uh, represents poetry, and particularly this sonnet itself. If you think about the fact that this sonnet was written over four hundred years ago, there is an aspect to this poem that suggests that Shakespeare knows that his poem transcends time. It escapes time and therefore it's as close as one can get to being immortal. This poem, the poem will live for much longer than either the speaker of the poem or the lover that's being spoken about, I think is the point that he's making here. And the, the lover who's being described will grow in these lines and live on in these lines. So. Rather than achieving immortality in a, in a sort of um, supernatural way or through divine intervention, the lover will achieve immortality in the lines that Shakespeare himself has written, which is almost a brag, a humble brag on Shakespeare's part, I suppose. OK, we've come to the end of the third quatrain, the final quatrain. And we've had that very important volta, haven't we? So, again, it's a good time to pause before we go on to the final couplet. So can I get you to pause the video and to again just check your understanding, write a short summary of that of that last quatrain from line nine through to line uh, twelve. Okay, and then welcome back. If you've if uh, thank you for pausing the video and make I hope that again was helpful for you in terms of uh, consolidating your own understanding of the poem. We now finish on and I'm sorry about my uh, I'll try and use a lighter pencil next time. Uh, we now finish on that couplet, that Shakespearean couplet. Remember, that's one of the hallmarks, one of the telltale signs of a Shakespearean sonnet, so that it ends with a rhyming couplet, OK? Um, and he's had this brilliant volta where he's, again, managed to completely transform his previous argument. And he's promised immortality to his lover within the lines of the poem, it's, within the lines of the poem itself, rather than... Uh, any kind of supernatural or, super, or magical way. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, 
So long lives this, and this gives life to thee. And I think, again, we've got this nice use of anaphora, which you'll remember, hopefully, from Shakespeare uh, and Richard III. Anaphora is the repetition of a phrase, so so long as, so long. So long as men can breathe. So, so, long, as, so long as there are men, so long as human, humankind, humankind can breathe, so long as, essentially, it's, it's kind of metaphorical still, but he's saying so long as there are human beings, and so long as they have eyes that can see, fairly straightforward. I think, actually, this is a surprisingly straightforward final couplet. So, so long as men can breathe, so long as eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. And that's a nice, simplistic, uh, I'll, I'll describe it as a flourish, isn't it? Because what he's saying here is that so long as uh, humankind, human beings, read poetry and have eyes to see poetry, so long lives this. So he knows that his poem, his poem will be uh, trans transcendent, okay? Which means it will, it will, it will, it will, li it will live for beyond the mortal lifespan. It will be, it will be an immortal work of art. Um, so he knows it will live, it will last forever, it will last for much longer than a human being. So long lives this and this gives life to thee. And through a kind of metaphorical alchemy, Shakespeare manages to promise immortality to his lover. He knows that if, if there are eyes that can see, if there are men that can breathe, then you will live forever within these lines of poetry. And what more beautiful um, and powerful poem or, or message could you send to your lover than promising them everlasting life through the work through a work of art which seems like a nice and appropriate way to end today's lesson so i would suggest you give me a very brief summary of the final couplet before you go on to complete the task that i've set on Sherman homework <coughs> i hope today's lesson was useful i hope you enjoy the poem as much as i do and i hope this really gave you an understanding of what the poem is all about uh, and I'll see you next time. Thank you very much for watching and make sure you complete those tasks. See you again soon.